Hello and welcome to the Luke Lunchtime Takeaway. Week by week we're going through the Gospel of Luke and we're looking at a different part of the story each week as we listen to the words, the claims of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus and think more about his message. And our story this week begins with King Herod. Not the Herod who was around at the birth of Jesus, but another one, a new generation, and a king who had reason to be troubled. John the Baptist had preached against King Herod. He had um, warned him of what he had done because King Herod had broken up his brother's marriage. His brother Philip was married and Herod had had an affair with Philip's wife, stolen her away from him and married her himself. And John had preached against this and for that reason, John was put in prison. And now Herod's wife hates John the Baptist and she comes to her husband and she says, I want that man executed and I want to see his head presented to me on a silver platter. So John was executed. But a little while later, King Herod hears about Jesus and what he's preaching and the miracles that he's doing. And he is really panicked by this. And he begins to think maybe this is John the Baptist come back from the dead, sort of come to haunt him, if you like. Or maybe it's the prophet Elijah come back, or maybe it's one of the other prophets come back from the dead. And he's really spooked. And he's also therefore very interested to actually go and hear Jesus and find out what he says. Now, Luke records that here in verses uh, seven to nine. But he also then later on in the story, after the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000, which we looked at last week, he then describes a conversation between Jesus and his disciples. And it's quite similar to what was going on in Herod's mind. Jesus sits with his disciples and he asks them this question. Who do the crowds say that I am? And they answer him, well, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, some say one of the prophets come back from the dead. And then Jesus focuses the question a little bit more and he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. Now, that word Christ in Hebrew is the word Messiah. Uh, in Greek, it's the word Christ. It really means anointed. And in Israel's history, there were three kinds of people who were anointed. If you were a prophet of God, you were anointed. You were set apart as God's holy prophet because you spoke his holy word, his revelation. If you were a priest, you were anointed for your office because you uh, had to offer the people's prayers and sacrifices to God. And that was a holy thing to do. You were set apart by being anointed. And if you were a king, to rule over Israel. Likewise, you were anointed just as our queen was anointed when she was crowned. And Peter says, you are the Christ. You are the ultimate Christ. And he's actually absolutely right. God has revealed this to him. Jesus is in all three ways, the anointed one, the chosen one. He is the final prophet who reveals God to us in himself, in his own character. He is the final priest because he's going to offer himself on his cross as the greatest sacrifice of all. And he is the greatest king because he will rise from the dead and by his resurrection power, he has the right to rule over us. He is our prophet, priest and king, our Christ. And all of that meaning is caught up in the word Christ. Now, this means that we're coming to the very heart of Luke's gospel. And from here on in the story, all the lines move in the direction of Jerusalem. Jesus is heading to his death and the tension begins to build. Please don't imagine that somehow you can limit Jesus to just being a good moral teacher or to um, being a, an interesting, wise man that you can follow and you can just listen to his wisdom and let that guide you in life. Jesus will not allow you to limit him in that way. Jesus is not just somebody who stands with us in our suffering and uh, you know is there for solidarity in all the things that we suffer. He is the Christ. And that title only makes sense in the light of his death on the cross. He has come to die for the sins of the world 
and that's how we must make sense of him. And that's what he says to the disciples in the next verses. In, in verse 22, he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. This is his destiny to die on the cross as a ransom price for many and to rise from the dead, to break the power of death. Do you want to be a Christian? Do you want to follow Jesus? Then you have to reckon with his death for you. You must decide who Jesus is. You must respond to his claims. If he is the son of God, then you and I must surrender our lives to him. We need him to be our saviour. We need him to suffer in our place, to, to pay the price that we cannot pay. We need his resurrection power to give us a new beginning. And not only that, if we're going to follow him in our lives, then our lives are going to be cross-shaped as well. That is that what he did at the cross becomes the pattern for our lives, as, as he explained in the verses that follow. Verse 23, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? We can approach Jesus like King Herod. We're just sort of standing at a distance and we want to know about him. We want to know what he teaches and who he is, but we don't really want to let him close to us. Or if we're going to be Christians, we have to surrender our lives to him. When somebody becomes a Christian, a death occurs. Their old way of life dies and a new life is born in them. If we try to hold on to our life and control it ourselves, we will lose it. But if we lose our life, if we surrender it to Jesus, actually what happens is that we find new life. That's the heart of the message of Luke's gospel. And that's what we'll be exploring over the next couple of weeks. Next week, we're going to look at the story of the transfiguration, which is where we get a glimpse of Jesus in his heavenly glory as he prepares to go towards the cross. Thank you for joining me today, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week.